Uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And just, uh, we'll start in about verse 20. I kind of set the stage for you here. Uh, Jesus has been uh, arrested there in the garden. He was with his disciples, and now he's being brought uh, to be uh, tried in front of Pilate. I would say most, if not all of you, uh, know that story. And and he's there with, with Pilate, and Pilate begins to question him and ask him all these things. And now uh, Jesus is alone. He, he had Peter there with him in the garden, and Peter drew his sword out, and he cut off a man named Malchus's ear. Uh, Peter meant to cut off his head. Uh, he wasn't a skilled swordsman. He was a skilled fisherman. But when he was standing next to Christ right there, he felt like he could take on the world. But then a few moments pass, and now he's standing outside, and Christ is within the hall, and Peter's without, and he won't even stand up to a little girl. Uh, so I'm telling you, it matters how close you are to him, amen? But he's standing there, uh, Christ is with Pilate, and, and the Bible says in these previous verses that he doesn't really open his mouth, he doesn't really say a whole lot, he, he doesn't try to defend himself. Uh, Pilate says, so you're the king of the Jews, and he don't even say yes, he says, thou, thou sayest it. But here is a conversation I want to kind of bring you up to and see. And then Pilate asked those around, those that gathered there that, that wanted to crucify Christ. He asked them a very poignant question, a very personal question, a very powerful question, a very pressing question. And it's a question that I want you now to start taking inventory of your life. Uh, especially if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want you to start pondering this question as I'll read to you here in just a minute. And if I could, I would to God that I could sit down with every one of you uh, across the table and, and, and just look you in the eye and get to know you and you, me, and me, uh, ask you this question. I, I'm, I'm, that's my heart's desire. I really wish that the Lord, uh, time would allow that, but we, we all know that would be virtually impossible. However, I will tell you today that I'll be probably the last person to leave this place, and if you would like to sit and talk, or if you do have questions about what the Bible says, I'll do everything in my power to answer those. And here's the unique thing about me. If I don't know the answer, I'm crazy enough to say I don't know. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that there is a God in heaven. And I do know that he had a son named Jesus. And I do know that he died on the cross that my sins can be forgiven. And I also know that all I have to do to be saved is call upon him and ask him to save me. And the Bible tells me that he will no wise cast me out. He is not willing that any would perish. If you're here today and you're not saved, I would today if you would just give me your undivided attention for about 30 minutes and allow God to speak to your heart. I don't have a big vernacular. I, I don't have a, a, a big booming voice. I'm not the most well-spoken person ever. I, I butcher the, the, the English language, but I would to God that I could just sit and pour my heart out to you today just for a few minutes and ask you this question that Pilate asked these folks there. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 20. But the chief priests and elders pursued the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. There was a custom there that on this, on this day there would be a prisoner that would be released as a, as a, as a ceremonial thing and they would release him there on the Passover. And, the, and the, most of the time they wouldn't pick the wild one, the wicked one. They would mostly take someone who was well known in town, someone who didn't really do nothing that bad and they would let them go. And Pilate being a politician saying, this is my way out, surely, if I bring up the worst one, uh, it, Harry, you ever feel like you're the worst one? Uh, where's the honest people at? Feel like you're the worst, everybody gets it right but you? He said, if I bring up the worst one, surely that they'll, they'll pick him, to him to, to stay in prison and they'll let Christ go. And they bring up this Barabbas who was just a, a murderer and an insurrectionist and just a, just a horrible person, the absolute worst one in the prison. And there the, the Bible says that they said to, Pilate says, which one do you want to let go? And they said, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Let, let him go. And there they see the latter part of verse 20 is two words. It says they wanted to destroy Jesus. Can I tell you, just park it here for just a minute. You can slay him. You can betray him. You can talk bad about him. You can put him down, doubt if he's real, even question or not whether he's in your life. But I'll tell you something that you cannot do, Larry. You cannot destroy Jesus. You cannot destroy Christ. 
Even he defeated death, he is more powerful than that. He is more powerful, my friend, than any law, any limits, anything that anybody would put on him, any litigation, he is more powerful than that. You cannot destroy Jesus Christ. That was their plan. And now we see in verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, whether the twain will you that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Here's the question. Here is the persistent, personal, pressing, most present question that you need to answer in your life. He says, Pilate said unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? What in the world am I going to do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And they cried out, let him be crucified. And in one of the other gospels accounts of this, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. But Pilate is standing there. He's alone on the stage with Jesus. The multitude there crying out to him, crucify him, crucify him. But Pilate says, what am I going to do with Jesus? My friend, I want you to ask yourself that question right now. Young person, old person, mommy, daddy, mamma, papa, a preacher, friend, I want you to take an inventory. What am I going to do with Jesus? I want to look at a few folks that he had that influenced him and I hope to paint a parallel in your life that you've got these same people around you that's speaking to you. First of all, I want you to see his loved ones. His loved ones. Let me tell you something. If you've got a praying mommy, you are a very blessed person. If you've got a dad that you can stand and say, my dad may not be perfect, but he teaches us and he preaches us and he shares with us the Bible. If you've got praying mamma and papas and those who left great legacies for you, you can, should be so proud of your heritage. I've told you guys before, my grandfather, Rodney's grandfather, Terry's grandfather, was a preacher. He died when I was three months old. I, I never knew him, but he was a preacher, an old regular Baptist, uh, Pentecostal. Uh, I mean, they were they believed in holiness. And listen, uh, he he had a great reputation. He was a great man. And I went up, I believe it was on Monday or Tuesday, and I was cleaning his grave off. And on his grave, there's that phrase, and it drives me crazy, Rodney. It says, Jesus loves the pure and holy. He absolutely does. But I want to go up there one day and take a sharpie and write in the nasty and naughty. Amen? He loves us all. Thank God that he does. He does love the pure and holy, but he loved Barabbas the same that he loved, my friend, the, the, the most perfect person, the same that he loved uh, Peter or Bartholomew or all. Thank God that he doesn't love me based upon anything other than who he is. Thank the Lord for that. But first of all, I want to see his loved one. Verse number 19. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? Now what she is saying is, is he is not what everybody says he is. He is a just man. Don't have anything to do with him. She's saying, don't you dare have him crucified. Don't judge him. Get him out of here. I've suffered many things because of a dream. She says he is a just man. He is an innocent man. He is not what the world says he is. I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ is not what they say he is at school. He's not what they say he is in the coal mine. He's not what they say he is on the job site, my friend. They may mock him. Him. They may use his name in vain, but he is not somebody that's out to get you. He's not somebody that's mad at you. He's not somebody that you can't have a relationship with. He's not some Santa Claus in the sky. He is real. He's God's son in the flesh. And here's the part that you need to get a hold of and that we everyone struggle with. He loves you. He loves you. That's hard for me to really grasp because I really know me, Bob. I know how I am. I, I know where I come short. I know that I don't always get it right. But at the end of the day, I can pillow my head at night and I can say, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. This I know. Jesus knows me. This I love. My friend, listen, I want you to think right now, if you're a wife here and your husband is saved, I want you to know something. His greatest desire is for you to give your life to Jesus. If you're here this morning and your mommy is saved and you're not, her greatest desire is that you give your life to Jesus. I want you to know something. If you're here and your children are saved and you're not, Charlene, would you say amen right here that all you need in the world is to know that your parents are saved and don't go to church where you go I might not dress like you dress might not listen to the kind of music you listen to but bless God let them know that you know that you know that you trusted Jesus he is not what this world says he is 
Can three people honestly say he is different than what I thought it was? It's better than what I thought it was. I thought that going to church and serving the Lord was what you did when you was old and there was nothing else to do. Linda, I didn't mean to look at you when I said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was actually trying to get to Lisa. You just had to be in the way. I, I, that's what I thought. I, I thought that just, just, just serving the Lord was something that old people did. And, and listen, and they never acted like they enjoyed it one bit. Amen. They go to church and they stare at their watch more than they do the word. Ethan, say amen right there. It's not what you think it is. I thought it was a bunch of rules. I thought, I thought this saying that all they're going to give me is a handbook and what I, what I can't do no more, what I can't say no more, where I can't go no more. Thank God I am free from that. I am free from religion and I have fell in love with Jesus. Thank God Almighty to be free from that, from that bondage that says it's up to me, it's up to me, it's up to me. No, my friend, I plead the blood. It's up to him and him alone. I claim his righteousness and not mine. He is not what this world says he is. He's so much better. Listen to your loved one. Listen to your loved one and let them know. Listen, be bold. Family members, be bold and tell your family they need Jesus. At Thanksgiving, we're blessed enough to have every meal at our house. Praise the Lord. We get a cook. We get a clean up before them and after them. Terry, don't you say nothing. I'll tell on you. Terry will come in carrying armloads of Cool Whip bowls. All empty. She's taking home every leftover we got. And Thanksgiving, since she left, she ain't left yet. Thanksgiving this year, last year, we always say prayer, and I'm sure many of you do that. But the Lord pressed on my heart, baby, they need more than prayer. They need more than prayer. And I said, Lord, I, I don't want this to be awkward I don't want them to think that I'm self-righteous. I don't want them to think that I think they're horrible people. And he says, son, you got a job to do. And we held hands and began to pray. And I started preaching there. And maybe in a different manner. But I said, I want you to know something. I'm going to pray for you. But more than that, I'm going to pray God bless this food. But more than that, I want you to know that Jesus is real. He really loves you. Right in the midst of all the things that you're doing wrong. Right in the midst of all of your sin. He wants to bring you out of that. We need that kind of holy boat to tell folks I love you and Christ is the answer he had his loved ones but he also had the loud ones in Luke 23 verse 23 he cries out what shall I do with this man Jesus and they were instant with a loud voice requiring that he might be crucified and the voice of them prevailed over the chief priest he had his loved one but he also had the loud ones the loud ones crucify him crucify him, don't have nothing to do with him. And this world still screams out to the top of their lung on every soapbox channel, on every channel on TV, everything. Listen, your baby's just carrying these things around and it would do you some good, mommy, daddy, to take that thing every now and then and go through it and watch them squirm, amen? Amen? amen. Listen, not everything on that thing's good. How'd I get off on this? The loud voices are telling them, sis, don't have nothing to do with Jesus. Don't have anything to do with... Can you imagine how hard it would be today to go to one of these high schools and try to be a Christian? Can you imagine? It's hard for you at your workplace. You imagine what these kids hear and, and the nonsense that goes in their little ears and, and I pray for my kids every day. I tell them every day of their life when I take them to school. First Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Who you hang around with is going to have an effect on you. You show me your friends. I'll show you your future. You can't say I want to fly like an eagle and hang out with turkeys. Amen. There's always people that's going to pull you back and say, don't you go to church. Don't you go to Bible study. Don't you get in Bible. Don't you go to, uh, to, 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 to uh, VBS and work there. There's all these loud voices that are telling folks, listen, don't worry about that stuff. Do that when you're old. Don't listen to that, my friend. Listen to your loved ones. I'm begging you today to really ask yourself, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with him? 
What am I going to do with him? There's going to always be somebody, Donnie, to say crucify him. Don't have nothing to do with him. Why would you want to live that way? Why do you want to go to church? Why do you want to be around those folks? Oh, my friend, listen. But at the end of the day, I promise you, there's something inside of them, Keith, that wants it too. Amen? He had his loved ones. He had the loud ones. But he also had the lone one. In 19 and 10 of John's gospel, you don't have to go there, John boy. He has a conversation and Pilate says, don't you know that I had the power to take your life? And Jesus says, you don't have any power over me. You don't have anything over me except what is given to you. I, I, I wonder today, I wonder today if it was just you and Jesus. Coach, at the end of the day, if it's just you and him, what are you going to tell him? What would you tell him? Would you say, I, I didn't want to listen to the crowd? Would you, would you say, I wanted to be saved? I, I wanted to serve you, but I didn't understand. Listen, there's a lot you don't understand, but what are you doing with what you do understand? Oh, it breaks my heart to see. I don't know how to get over this. I don't know how to delete it to say, well, we'll get them next week. And when you see people come, they raise their hand, tears pouring down their face. They grab the back of pews and they shake all over, but they go right back out that door the same way they come in. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you so afraid of? You're afraid of what you got to give up, afraid of what you got to start doing and stop doing. You got all these thoughts in your head because of the loud voices around you. We say that we live in the Bible belt, Harry, right in the buckle. I think we live in the tradition belt. I think we live in the religion belt. And let me tell you something. I'll say this right to your face. The devil uses religion and tradition more than he does the strip club, more than he does the bar, more than he does pornography and alcohol all combined. He takes that religion and he tells you, it's up to you, it's up to you. And if she, have you ever said this? Well, honey, if he's going to make it, I ain't got nothing to worry about. But the problem is you're not measuring up to him, you're measuring up to him. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory. It was just him and Jesus. It was just him and Jesus. Block out the preacher. Block out the singing. Block out the distractions that's around you right now. And imagine Christ looking at you through tear to him dies. Oh, I wish I had a vernacular to paint this picture the way that I want to. It's just you and him standing there alone. And he looks at you and says, what are you going to do with me? Moreover, the way he asked it to Peter, I believe it was Peter, says, what think ye of Christ? What do you think about me? What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And bless God, Peter got it right. He says, we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. It's just you and him. What are you going to do with Jesus? He had the loud ones. He had the lone ones. And my friend, he had so many people that was in his ear confusing him. Confusing him. And, and just for a minute... This is, it's all been introduction. Give me, it's 20 till. Yeah, we're getting out early today. Thank you for not saying amen right there. I appreciate that. But I get my time back next week. No, I keep up with it. I wonder if we could kind of put him on trial this morning. He's on trial there with Pilate. Pilate gets to be the politician. Pilate says, he actually tells him, go and you all go judge him by your law or take him to Herod. And, and Herod happened to be in, in town then and they become friends and they hate it. Anyway, that's a whole other story. It's in Luke. It's good. You ought to read it. We put him on trial this morning. What am I going to do with Jesus? Anytime there's a good trial, there needs to be some witnesses. Amen. I'd like to take you on a journey in God's word this morning just for a few minutes and maybe call some witnesses to the stand. First of all, I wonder if we could ask if we could ask John the Baptist, John, you left in your mother's womb. You were filled with the Holy Ghost. Hey, what shall we do with Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? He would say, oh, boys, listen, listen. He, he, behold, 
Behold, he's the Lamb of God. He'll take away the sin of the world. Oh, but John, what about when you're in trouble? Listen, I'm telling you, boys, I was in jail one time, and I was in trouble, and I began to have some doubts. Is he the one? Is he the one? Is he the one? And when I was in doubt, when I was in darkness, when I was in distress, he sent somebody to me, and he reminded me of what he'd done. And let me tell you something, boys. He is the one. Bless God. It's all about him. He is the one. John, what do you think? What are we going to do with him? Oh, my friend, thank you, Lord. And what about Peter? Peter, as I already told you, he would say he is. He is the Son of God. Peter would say whenever you get it wrong, when you won't stand up to a little girl, when you're standing by the fire cussing with boys, when you say I don't want nothing to do with him, and once you have an encounter with him and you see him a long way off, I tell you what you want to do. You'll take your clothes off. You'll jump overboard. You'll swim and do everything you've got to do just to get back to where he was just to be next to him because next to him and with him they ain't nothing like it he's the greatest thing that ever happened to me boy I wish I felt good this morning what do you think about him Peter what are you going to do with him oh if there's ever anybody in the Bible I identify with it's Peter he's a redneck it's in the Bible read your Bible he missed church on Sunday and went fishing naked. If that ain't somebody out ahead of Wally Branch, I don't know what is. Peter, when you don't get it right, when you ever say the right thing, you all know that's the kind of pastor you have? I don't ever say the right thing. I hardly ever do the right I mean, I'm a disaster. I'm sorry. This is all he's got to work with. I'll just be real with you. I don't, I don't sit at my house and sit around and say, um, uh, I don't, that ain't me. I mean, I, I raise my voice in my house. It's like, if you don't take that garbage out, I'm not perfect. How hard is it? You walk by it 15 times, take it out. Are you glad you come to church this morning? What if you were to ask? What if you were to ask John? The writer, John would say, he's the word of God. He was made flesh and, and dwelt among us. But the thing about John, the only time you see the disciple who Jesus loved, the only time you see those, that phrase is in the book of John. John called himself that. John said, I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like he loves you more than you ever deserve? Do you ever just say, how could he love somebody like me? Do you ever just feel, oh, I'm his favorite. If it wasn't for me being his favorite, oh, he is so good to me. Oh, look at my health. Look at my family. Look at the joy that he's given me. And the devil will tell you, try his best, and he does it to me to destroy that. But when you just sit back and you say, oh, I'm his favorite. He holds me when nobody's there. He comes to me when the preacher don't. He comforts me. And sometimes, my friend, I just worship him. Do you ever just worship God by yourself? Let me empower you to do that. Listen, it wasn't too long ago. I was driving down the road. I'll tell you exactly where I was. I was going up that big hill at Jenkins right there, right before you drop off. I was listening to a Blanton sister CD and the Holy Ghost filled that place and I began to preach and i tell you what, brother, it was some of the best preaching I ever heard, scholar. I was amen in myself. I got saved three times right there in that car. I began to take a fit and I pulled over on the side of the road. I got out. I just threw my hands up and I screamed to the heart as loud as I could. Glory, glory, glory. And I said, I'm going to go to jail. I guarantee you somebody's going to drive by. But listen, maybe that ain't how you do it, but I was just so overwhelmed with me being his favorite with how good he is to me. And what are you talking about, Bubby? I was in the worst storm of my life. I had just buried my daddy, my hero, my very best friend. But at the end of the day, I got a promise that I'll see him again. He's not in a wheelchair no more. He can raise both hands and say, God is good. I'm telling you right now, he's, I, I feel like I'm his very favorite. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? Thomas. Now Thomas, we know you've got your doubts. Thomas, your name's Didymus. He did him his church. Jesus showed up. Some of y'all get that tomorrow. You'll be in Wendy's and he'll hit you. 
Thomas, what do you think about him? Thomas would say, boys, if you just have an encounter with him, if he just touches you, and you just touch him, all you can do is step back and say, my Lord and my God. He's the greatest thing ever. Even when you have doubts, isn't God still good? Oh, Thomas, Thomas, what are we going to do with him? Oh, you were to ask an angel. An angel would say, unto you is born a Savior. Now listen, all of these folks, Lazarus would say, he is live. The woman at the well would say, press through and just touch him. There's nobody, I've got a hundred more we can go through. But I wonder if I could take a, just a quick trip around the room and ask some of you, oh, Larry, what do you think about him? I know where he's brought you from. Isn't he good? Isn't he good? Isn't God good? Christy, aren't you glad what he's done in your life? Praise the Lord. Uh, other one there, aren't you glad? What he's, I'm going to keep going until somebody smiles and waves their hand in the air like they just don't care. Aren't you glad? What he, how many are happy at what he's done in your life, my friend? Isn't he good? Isn't he good? What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? It's just you and him. We've asked all of his friends. I've asked all of you. That's not a fair trial. You've stacked the deck. Let's bring in some people that hated him. Now let's ask them. What about the, before we do that, what about the, the most supreme witness? God, what are we going to do with Jesus? What do you think about him? He would say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now there's those that hated him. There was those that hated him, the Pharisees the, and the Sadducees. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. Adeline, that's quality preaching joke right there. The Pharisees, the worst thing they could say about him is this man receives sinners. That's the worst thing they could say. I'm glad he does. Amen. What about that centurion soldier that stood by the cross? He would say, truly, truly, this man is the son of God. And what about Judas? Oh, Judas, you do understand in the upper room, the upper room, the way they would do the breakfast, the breakfast, the last supper, they wouldn't sit in there. I know, was it, who painted that picture? Was it Da Vinci? Was it? If nobody knows him, we'll say it was Da Vinci. They weren't sitting at the table like that. They didn't have fried chicken. They wasn't like that. The way they would eat, they would put rest their arm on this side and then they'd lay their head on the man beside of them and their feet would be there. I, I believe if we could, if I had time this morning, I could show you in scripture that I believe it was Jesus who sat next to Judas because when he says he's the one that betrayed he says the one that dips and he hands it to him. I believe that Jesus' head was right on Judas's chest and he betrayed him with a kiss as Jesus was sweating the Judas had the blood of Christ right on his lips. Now you think about that. And, and I know you all have seen this going around and you've heard this, that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, but he got to eat too. Oh, what a Savior. What a Savior. Judas would say, oh, oh, his blood is precious. I made a terrible mistake. I wish I could take it all back. I wish I could take it all back. Oh, my friend, what are you going to do? With Jesus, we could ask the demons. Demons would say, we know him. We know him and we tremble right at his name. We, we tremble right at his name. Uh, again, what are you going to do with Jesus? Notice the question. I didn't ask you, what are you going to do with church? I know some people that's been what we call church hurt, right? And church people can be horrible. I mean, it's some of the meanest club members I've ever been around. Let's just be honest. He didn't say, what are you going to do with church? He didn't say, what are you going to do with denominational? What about them bunch of free wills? When you say you're a free will Baptist, poop, you're put into a box. You are, whether you, admit, whether you fit or not. Let me just tell you, <laughs> I don't fit. Both figuratively and literally. He didn't ask what you do with denominationalism. Here's what else he didn't ask. What are you going to do with preacher? 
Some of y'all may not like me too much. I'm praying God get you. <laughs> you need to quit. I don't like taking unspoken requests. Brother Lucian would say, and they got an unspoken request, and they are saying, God, kill him. And he's saying, Lord, honor that request. <laughs> he didn't ask that. He didn't say, what are you going to do with the preacher? What are you going to do with the church? What are you going to do with the denomination? As real as I could possibly be with you today, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do? Just you and him. And, and, if, and if I'm making you uncomfortable this morning, I say glory. This is one of the things that insults me. It's when a lost person comes up to me on the way out the door and say, that was good preaching, I enjoyed it. Don't say that to me if you're lost. That's not a compliment. The word of God should make you uncomfortable. Thinking about what you're going to do with Jesus if you're lost as Buddha ought to make you uncomfortable. Please don't tell me. Please don't tell me that you enjoyed it. I remember what that was like, sitting back there and knowing that, that listen, Arnold Turner had a finger that long. He uh, he pulled out of that pocket. He'd just keep it coming. He pointed it right to me. I was certain, Harry, that my mom and my aunt Betty called him every Saturday night and told him everything that I did all week. I was certain of that, and I was mad at them old heifers. And he would preach, and I'd get convicted, and I didn't like it. And everybody else in there looked like they was, and I was miserable. For five, listen to me, for five years of my life, I didn't do nothing but go to church. Go through the emotions. So my aunt and my mom, my sisters would shut up. God started dealing with my heart for five years. And I would cry, and I'd weep, and I had a little niece. At the time, she's 24 now, 25. And every time during the altar call, I'd make sure I had that baby because I couldn't go up and pray because I had the baby in my hand. I had every kind of excuse in the world, and, and a lot of times right before I could tell he was starting to close, I, I made sure I went to the bathroom. I could fight it off out there. But thank God that he never gave up on me. Thank God he never gave up on me. But it come down to this question. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? I'll be honest. There's some stuff in that church that I didn't like. I didn't like that singing. They, they let one old lady sing. She couldn't sing at all. I, I couldn't stand that. I didn't like it. I didn't like sometimes when they would you, it'd start thinking that you were done and then somebody else would say something at the end of service. I was like, we was almost out of here. I didn't like that. That offering stuff. I only, I only wanted my money. I mean, I was making like $6 an hour. All they cared about was my money. There's a lot of stuff I didn't like. But it didn't matter. They didn't ask me that. The question that kept going over in my heart, what the Holy Spirit kept dealing with me, is what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? Will you bow your heads with me just for a moment? Brad, you want to play something? As honest as I can be and sincere as places I can find in my heart this morning, would you please give heed to this question? What are you going to do with Jesus? Jesus.